conquering the major city-states, yes, there were a lot of smaller towns and other peoples and tribes to deal with, but by and large, the major battles had been done. God changes Joshua's role from a commander to a city planner. Before he was um, leading military strategy, now he's portioning lots, cities. He's divvying up the land among the different tribes. And honestly, some people get bogged down here with their daily Bible reading because there are a lot of hard-to-pronounce names and places. Now, this is not in your notes, but just a little extra to throw at you. Some people ask, and I'm dating myself now, why is this phone book section here in the Bible? And there are several reasons I want to point out. Number one, these are real people, real names in real history which points to a real God who cares. We may not know these people, but for these people, maybe their descendants, to see their ancestors' names in the Bible, how thrilling is that to have your great-grandfather or someone listed in, in this um, phone book section? Number two, this shows that God is faithful to his promises. He promised this to Abraham 430 years before. And, and now it's being fulfilled. Real places, real people, a real God. Number three, this reveals God's mercy and generosity to a very undeserving people. They kept complaining, they kept sinning, griping, and yet God has been faithful and merciful to them for throughout the centuries. So three quick small points to, to highlight here. Why? Why these names? There's a reason. Now, the Young Adult Fellowship is going through an inductive study of 1 Corinthians, and two studies ago, we covered chapter 10. And the cool thing is, verse 6 through 11 says this, Now, these things took place as examples for us that we may not desire evil as the Israelites did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. And we are faced with that temptation of idolatry. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. And he sums it up by saying, now these things that happened, the very things that we're studying, that we've been studying in this book, they happened as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. So they're an example to teach us. And this is on whom the end of the ages has come. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 through 11. We can learn so much from this if we pay attention. We don't have to repeat the same sins and mistakes, errors that the Israelites did. So this next section from chapter 13 to 22 is all about Israel's land inheritance. The word land is used 85 times in this book. The words inherit or inheritance shows up another 56 times. So this is a very important theme. It fulfills God's promise to Abraham, just as I mentioned that he gave 430 years prior. Now, some of you know that my family is looking to buy a home in Orange County. We currently live in Diamond Bar. It, Right now, it's not bad with the quarantine, but now it's starting to open up. Traffic is getting worse. And so we're looking to buy a house closer in between Chris's work and my work, but we're kind of leaning a little bit towards Irvine now. We're thinking about Huntington Beach. It's perfectly in the middle, 20 minutes each way, but just trying to be good stewards of his, you know, his finances. We're thinking Irvine will appreciate much faster. So if we can buy in Irvine, maybe, maybe we'll do that. I don't know. Nowadays... When we looked for a house 20 years ago, the internet was just in its infancy, okay? Nowadays, all you have to do is go online. Click on Zillow or Redfin or there's some other ones, right? Um, I've been comparing lot sizes, seeing how close the house is to the freeway, and another important one, seeing how close the house is to Costco, right? That's super important. Um, researching the crime rate, et cetera. And so I can identify with these tribes as they settle down in their permanent homes. This is kind of what it felt like. They're going, oh, where, where do we stay? Do we get to be near a river? You know, do we have natural protection? Is, is the vegetation good? What's it like where we're going to settle down, right? This is what the Israelites are going through. 
Now, it starts out verse 1 with something very interesting, Joshua's age. It says, now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. <laughs> oh, man, he's brutal. And there remains yet very much land to possess. Now, God is brutally honest here. I mean, he could have softened it up and said, hey, Joshua, you don't look a year over 60, man. You look pretty good, right? No. He goes straight for the jugular, and he says, Joshua, man, you old. <laughs> you know, he's, you're old. And he's, a, he's 100 years old here. We find out in a few chapters later, 11 chapters later, we find out that Joshua dies at 110. So this last section covers 10 years of his life. And don't you think it's interesting how we count age? You know, one of our young married couples is expecting their first child. And we typically say, oh, you know, the baby is in her 34th week. Or, you know, we use weeks, right? And then we go from weeks to months. And I ask parents for permission um, as Steffi and son's daughter just turned 10 months old. You know, we use 10 months, right? And then later, they get to halvesies. Mark and Joss's oldest daughter, Maddie, is five and a half. Once you get to junior middle school, we don't talk about half years anymore, right? Right? Will Ty, happy 24th birthday. <laughs> happy two dozen. You know, we use full years. And as you get older, we use decades. And if you're really old, we don't talk about age anymore, <laughs> right? Now, wow, she's in her 30s? Or, or can you believe he's in his 60s? He could pass for 40. Now, I was, I was tempted to, there's this old Chinese model. He's actually 85 years old, Wang Shendo or something like that. And man, he looks good. I wish I looked as buff and as, you know, fit. And I didn't want to put him, I, think, I thought it'd be too distracting, right? So, but, but Joshua was 100 years old here. And I think God is reminding Joshua, you don't have much time left. You got to get going on, on the job I'm entrusting you. There's lots of land to possess. The major battles have been fought. Good job. But now it's time to settle the people in. So as Joshua is nearing the end of his life, and others, others will finish his work. The point is this. Let me see if I can... Uh, Oh, I want the one with Chinese, yes. All right, that's cool. The point is this. Joshua served God wherever he placed him, whatever God called him to do. This is very humbling because we like to serve God on our own terms. God, I don't like this church. You know, not enough people my own age. You know, this other church is more this or... But it, wherever God has put you, serve faithfully until he calls you elsewhere. Just like we talked about with King Henry III of Bavaria. Just like we talked about the Israelites in exile in Babylon. You may never finish the work you think God has called you to accomplish. Do your part faithfully, but trust that God will complete his work. Others might finish it. This is his work, not ours. The battle belongs to the Lord, not to us. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Workers come and go, but God will accomplish his will. You see, after Moses, God raised up Joshua. After Joshua, God raised up others. One of the first deacons, Stephen, was martyred. But God raised up Paul to bring the gospel to the world. John Huss was martyred for standing firm on the word of God, defying the Pope and, and the errors of the Roman Catholic Church. And he was burned at the stake. But God raised up Martin Luther after him to continue the work. So we don't have to worry what happens after we die. Thankfully, we will be in heaven. We just need to faithfully do our best with what God entrusts us to do wherever he puts us whatever he calls us to do. So that's the point. Serve him wherever he has placed you. Don't serve God on your terms. Serve God on his terms. Because serving God on our own terms is a nice way to say disobedience. Okay? 
So this is Joshua's last task, starting from verse 2 to 6. God tells him what minor towns need to be conquered. He starts with the south. Next to Egypt, he moves up north. And then he points the Philistines and goes up even further north to Lebanon. And God promised that whole entire region to Israel. But the northern part today, it's a separate country called Lebanon. And that comes from Israel's disobedience. And from the word Philistine comes our present-day word Palestine. Did you know that? It's pretty cool, huh? They were never a nation, never a nation, and they were nomads, okay? Um, five Philistine towns, Gaza, Ashdod, Eshkelon, Gittim, Ekron, plus a number of other smaller tribes. You don't have to memorize that. It's just, it's there in the text. God promises to drive out the people in southern Canaan, and he did afterwards. Joshua's task is to divvy up the land by lot, by dice, so to speak, in our vernacular, as an inheritance. Joshua brought them across Jordan into the promised land, but they still have some work to do. It's a land they need to settle. So again, the point is this. Serve him wherever he has placed you, whatever he has called you to do. If you're not serving, you're not obeying. Because God has trusted us with gifts. God has entrusted every believer with spiritual gifts. And if you're not using them for his glory, for his church, we're not in obedience. And so from verse 17 to 13, skipping that one verse 14 in the middle and going from 15 to 32, we have the division of the land east of the Jordan. Okay? And God says, now, therefore, divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. And then this part, with the other half tribe of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites, to receive their inheritance, which Moses gave them beyond the Jordan eastward to the right of the Jordan, okay, River Jordan. So what's going on here? Why are they to the east of Jordan? That's not the promised land. The promised land is west of the Jordan. Nine and a half tribes will split the land to the west. Two and a half tribes get the land to the east. And as Israel approached the land of, in Numbers 30, this is what happened. These two and a half tribes notice that the land east of the Jordan is rich. It's just so green and just dense and it's verdant and it's lush. It's great pasture land for sheep and cattle and other livestock. So they bargained with Moses, asking to settle there. They didn't want to cross the Jordan River. And Moses was not happy. Because does that mean they're not going to fight with the rest of the Israelites? You know, they get to just camp there and enjoy the land all by themselves. These two and a half tribes want to splinter off and cause disunity. So the two and a half tribes bargain with Moses and say, Okay, we'll leave our families here, our livestock, our wives, our children here. But the warring men will go with you, and we will fight these major battles with you. And when that's done, we'll come back. And even though Moses didn't like it, he got permission, and he said, okay, this is not the promised land, but if this is what you want, okay. So that's what's happening here in verses 7, um, 7 through 13, 15 to 32. These two and a half tribes say, major fighting's done. We want to get back to our families, to the east of the Jordan. Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh return. And 1532, get into the nitty-gritty of these two and a half tribes. We won't go through all the village names, all right? We can identify the Jordan River. We can identify the Arnon Gorges, some obvious ravines. But when this live stream ends, most of you won't remember nor care about all these other names. But there's a more pressing issue that I want us to focus on. A more, a more foundational issue. These two and a half tribes settled east of the Jordan River. This was not God's promised land. This is not what God desired for them. Yes, the land was bountiful, rich, flat, full of vegetation, perfect for grazing livestock. But there, there were no natural boundaries. There were no defenses. There was no river to protect them, no hills, nothing. They were vulnerable. 
So what happened was Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh's disobedience led to unnecessary suffering. You see that? Right here. Disobedience leads to unnecessary suffering. This is why throughout Israel's history, when the Moabites attacked, guess who gets decimated? These two and a half tribes. When the Amalekites attacked, guess who were vulnerable? Yeah, these two and a half tribes. When the Assyrians came, guess who were the first to be conquered? Yep. The Arameans, the Babylonians. These two and a half tribes were always the first to fall. Yeah? When there was no war, they had the best place to, to raise their cattle, etc. cetera. Um, but when enemies came, they were the first to fall. They were first to be killed, the first to be wiped out, first to be taken into captivity. So this disobedience is what we face. We're tempted with a lot of things. Oh, God, if I just cheated a little bit here, I could get to my goal faster. Or if I just lied about my resume here, I could get that position I wanted. And God says, well, you don't need to lie. Followers of Christ don't need to give in to these shortcuts. Well, if I just sleep around with my boss or if I do this, you know, right? No. You'll be the first to fall. It will lead to unnecessary suffering. It will lead to these consequences that are just worse off than when you first started. So, first serve wherever, whatever God calls you to. But secondly, do it in a way that is righteous. Do it in a way that follows Christ. Remember, God told Abraham, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the sands and the beach of the seashore, right? And Abraham was already 99 years old. And he was thinking, you know, actually earlier, a little bit earlier than that, I don't remember exactly what age. And he was thinking, I don't even have a kid yet. I don't know how much longer I'm going to have a kid. And so what does he do? He takes Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar, and has a boy with him, Ishmael. And, and that was not God's way. You know, he, that that disobedience led to unnecessary suffering. He thought he was trying to accomplish God's will, but he was taking shortcuts. And it's the same thing for us. Don't settle for anything less than God's promises. Do it God's way. So it gets to Reuben. Now, anyone on site here remember who Reuben is? Grace, remember? You know who Reuben is? No? Any of you? Nobody knows who Reuben is? Oh, yeah, okay. I'm not going to ask Roland because, Roland, you have seminary training. Yay, we have Jessica knows who Reuben is. Reuben is the oldest, the firstborn. That's right, the firstborn of Jacob. Firstborn of his 12 sons. Now, the law of the firstborn for Semitic culture back then dictates that the firstborn gets how much of the inheritance? Double portion. Very good. Thank you, Chris. Yes, a double portion. But for some reason here, Reuben does not. You see, when Reuben's father Jacob is about to die, he gathers his 12 sons together and gives his last will and testament. He starts with Reuben, rightfully because he's the oldest, saying, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first fruit of my strength, preeminent in dignity, preeminent in power. But then all of a sudden, he does a 180 turn here. You know, it sounds really good, preeminent, the first and foremost. He's the one who made... Jacob, a father, right? Verse 4, Genesis 49. Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence because, whoa, you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. Whee! What's going on here? What's he talking about? Well, you see, Reuben went into his father's tent And he had sex with his father's concubine, Bilhah. And this was not mere lust. No, this was calculated political family drama here. You see, a man who wanted to assert superiority over another man, the way to do that would be to have sexual relations with that man's wife or concubine. So that's what Reuben was trying to do. He was trying to say, I am superior to you. I had relations with your concubine. And there's some more intrigue to that. He's trying to position his mother Leah to be the, you know, Jacob's anyway. 
So Jacob says, you will not have preeminence. He, ba he basically said, you shall not pass. That's what he said. So Reuben does not get a double portion. In fact, the portion he gets is inferior. He wrongly chooses his land inheritance outside of the promised land in that area that was so vulnerable, always the first to fall to foreign invasions. So that's Reuben to the east of the Jordan. No double portion. Instead, he gets one of the worst places. His prophecy, his, his inheritance from Jacob is fulfilled. And then 24 to 28 is Gad's inheritance. Their territory was Jazer, etc., etc. That's in his inheritance. Then the half-tribe of Manasseh. You see, the other half-tribe is to the west of the Jordan there. This half-tribe settles east, and this territory, territory was from all these interesting names to all these other interesting name areas. And that's the real estate we're talking about. That's the Google map we're talking about. That's where they get to live, okay? So there are 12 sons, 12 tribes. We come to this tribe of Levi, one of the sons of Jacob. He was not given a land inheritance. So you have 11 tribes, and that always puzzled me earlier in my Christian life. I was like, what? I'm just confusing. Levi doesn't get a land inheritance, and he's not named here. What's going on? There are 12 tribes of Israel. You see, what happens is Joseph receives a double portion. That's how Jacob gives his last will and testament in Genesis 49 to Joseph. You will be abundant. You will have uh, great fruitfulness, etc. And his two sons are Ephraim, Ephraim and Manasseh. So we're back to 12. Levi doesn't get land inheritance, but Joseph gets that double portion. We're back to 12 tribes again. What's going on with the Levites? We see in verse 14 that the tribe of Levi alone, Moses gave no inheritance. It says, the offerings by fire to the Lord God of Israel are their inheritance. And for the rest of Levi, we need to jump to verse 33. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance. You hear that? Just as he said to them. So what does this mean? It means that the sacrifices, all that good meat, um and um and um, you know, steak, yes, offered by fire as a sacrifice to God, there, a portion of that would be given to Levites as their food. No land, no real estate. They got food, no property. And not only was this food their inheritance, it says the Lord God was their inheritance. So what does this mean? It means that all the other tribes of Israel supported the Levites with the tithe so that the Levites could work in the temple or later uh, in the tabernacle or later in the temple. And a portion of these offerings offered to God were to be given to Levites to serve as their food and their sustenance. Also, they received 48 small cities small towns scattered throughout Israel in the midst of all these tribes. Presumably, each tribe got four little towns of Levites. That's how it worked. Instead of having one central Levite tribe area, they were scattered all over Israel. They were not separate from Israel in their own enclave to become out of touch. They were scattered amongst Israel, every tribe. See, the Levites would be in the midst of God's people, teaching them God's word, teaching them, leading them in worship. God wants worship to go alongside our daily lives. He doesn't want them to be separate. He doesn't want them to be two distinct domains. When we study for that test, when we prepare for that interview that's coming up, when we turn in that project at work, he wants that to be our worship to him. See, Levitical parallel in the midst of all the tribes. He didn't want them to be separate. Like, I'll do my six days, God. You leave my Saturday alone, and I'll give you Sunday. No. Every day belongs to the Lord. 
Not only is the food to be part of the Levites' inheritance, it says God, the Lord God of Israel, was to be their inheritance. You don't get any land, Levites, but you get the God of this land. That's what he's saying. They got proximity. They got intimacy with God. They were supported as students of God's word, teachers of God's word. God was their inheritance. Now, people whom God calls into ministry, we love ministry. And something that I, um, I really appreciate about serving with other people who are called into ministry, one attitude I love is when I ask people to do things, they say, how can I do it? I'm there. They don't say, oh, let me count this. And No, I'm there. Where do you want me to start? We love serving. We love teaching God's word. We love preparing worship. Um, I really appreciate Roland coming here when sometimes he's not preaching. And he says, what can I do to serve, right? That's something I appreciate about Sunu. When I ask him to do something, he's like, let's do it. Let's make it happen, right? When I graduated seminary, my first full-time job at this church, uh, not this church, but at a church, they gave me $1,200 a month. Yeah, it was a while ago, but even then, you could not live off of $1,200 a month. And thankfully, my wife had just start, had started working full-time also, more, making more than twice what I was making. But despite that, the money was not an issue. I was just happy to serve in church. I was happy to say, I get to preach. I get to lead worship. I get to, to minister to God's flock and counsel them. I love this. I get to see lives changed. And if you didn't pay me for it, I'd still do it. If God called me to another job, I'd still be here to do the same work. I thought we would have to rent the rest of our lives, but God is my inheritance. After a couple years of saving up, we bought this tiny two-bedroom, it was only a 1,000 square feet house, one bath in Alhambra. That was our first house. Isn't Google Street View awesome? Right? I can go back and say, hey, that's my house. I put in that door. I put in those double-pane windows my ha- myself. Wow, good memories. And God has been exceedingly gracious to us ever since. God is my inheritance. Now, I'm not saying that if you serve God, he's going to guarantee you a house. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is if you serve God, God will be your inheritance. He'll provide for you in surprising ways. I've shared testimonies how my last term in seminary, I didn't have enough money. I'd run out of money. I had saved up money working at a software place, and I thought it was enough. But in you know, education, every year, tuition goes up way faster than inflation, and I didn't count, keep that in account. I was like, oh, no, my last term, I don't have enough money. And the day before my, my tuition was due, a check came in my school mailbox for exactly the amount I needed, rounded up to the nearest hundred. And I talked to the person. It was anonymous, but I was able to find out who it was later. I thanked them, and I said, how did you know what my tuition was? And he said, your tuition? We had no idea. God just told us, God, this extra money that you have, just give it, give it to God's worker, and we, we just did it. And I was like, my goodness, I look at my tuition bill. It's exactly the same amount. And we were just blown away by God's inheritance, God's goodness to people who serve him. So the Levites did not have their own land inheritance. They were scattered, lived among the other tribes. But God was their inheritance. And you know, I think they got the better end of the deal than the other 11 tribes. On a more somber note, I remember visiting a church member's father in hospital as he was dying. He was rich, filthy, filthy rich. But he was divorced from his wife and estranged from his two adult kids. And one of his kids asked me to go visit him, witness to him, because he was not a believer. So I witnessed with him. I spent time with him. I sang hymns to him. I read scripture. I implored him, call on the name of Jesus Christ and be saved. And he at first was so arrogant. He said, I don't need you here. You know, I got tons of money. I got the best doctor. I'm the best hospital. You know, I got a mansion. I got a boat. You know, I don't need you. Just, But, you know, I could tell he, he didn't tell me to leave. He, he actually appreciated me being there. And then he told me his life story. And after a couple of visits, 
you know, he, I found he had millions of dollars in his bank account, and met, you know, all these different things. But what he realized as he lay there dying was that he had no one left, no one who loved him. And worse than that, he had no future in heaven. So I implored, with, I implored him, call upon the name of Jesus, and you can spend the rest of eternity with your loved ones who are believers. Please call upon the name of Jesus. Sadly, he never made a profession of faith. All he could do at the very end was cry, I have no one left. What use is all this money? And like I said, worse than that, he had no future in heaven. Mark 8.36 is a sobering reminder to us. For what does it profit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Now, why do I bring that up here? It's because a lot of times we are tempted by things of this world. We want to do this. I want to advance in this field. I want to advance in my career. And we make these compromises. Oh, I'm not going to go to this Wednesday Bible study. I'm not going to go to Bible uh, prayer meeting. Oh, I'm not going to go to Sunday service. I need to focus on this, my, my this. And God says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Brothers and sisters, we have choices that we make every single day. Are you using the gifts he's entrusted you with to build up his church? Or are you waiting for, well, I'm going to wait for my turn. I'm just here temporarily. I'm only here for college, just another two years. Oh, I'm waiting to get married and move on to another church. No. God says, build your house. Get married. Have kids. Plant your gardens. Eat from them. And glorify God while you're at it, wherever you are. Don't wait for the next best thing to happen, because that may never come. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Invest in the kingdom of God. Do whatever he tells you to do, wherever he calls you to be. And then we get into chapter 14. You might be thinking, oh, we don't have much time left. Don't worry. It's, just, it's pretty, we're going to wrap this up pretty quickly here. So faithfully serve him wherever he's placed you. Disobedience leads to unnecessary suffering. In ministry, God is our Inheritance, he is our riches, he is our abundance. And then the last point is with God, worldly weaknesses mean nothing. And so we get into the rest of the nine and a half tribes that go to the west of the Jordan. They've been looking forward to this for years, about five years of fighting, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, 430 years since Abraham and it says in verse 2, chapter 14, their inheritance was by lot. What does that mean? Well, they would take pottery shards. They would etch the name of their tribe onto a piece. They put 12 pieces in. And, and so presumably Joshua or someone who would randomly pick out a piece and say, okay, this, this next plot of land is yours. And the size is determined by your population, but this next area is yours. So God would be directing this sovereignly, providentially, by lot. Each tribe would be given land proportionate to the population. More people, more land. So the two and a half tribes east of the Jordan are taken care of. Some of the Levites are apportioned there. Here we see Joseph gets a double portion, one for each of his two sons. And it's the same deal with the Levites. No land inheritance for them. They, too, are scattered among the tribes. Verse 6, Judah comes first because they are, they are the largest tribe. And he's, they're, you know, he's scrambling around in that urn. Uh, pick, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's picked first. And they're the largest tribe. They have the most people. They'll be given a huge section of land. And so the people of Judah come before Joshua at Gilgal. But then something interesting happens. There's an interruption. There is a detour here. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, says to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me? Remember that? 
Now we look here, Caleb was a Kenizzite. Hmm, what's that? I don't remember that being one of the 12 tribes. You see, Kenizzites were not Israelites. They were outside of God's covenant. When the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, some Kenizzites joined themselves to the covenant of Israel, and so they became under the covenant of, of God as servants of Israel. They were believers, but they were outsiders. And Caleb at that time was a 40-year-old Gentile, a foreigner in the Jewish community. The name Caleb, by the way, uh, Susan and Roy have a son named Caleb. I think some of you know him, right? You old schoolers, you remember Caleb? Uh, the name Caleb means bold, wholehearted, passionate. When the 10 other scouts gave a faithless report, saying that, oh, no, they're giants in the land. We could never defeat them. And that discouraged all the people. Only Caleb and Joshua said, we should really obey God. Let's go conquer these people. It was only these two scouts, Joshua and Caleb. Um, by the way, Caleb does sound like another Hebrew word, the word for dog. Okay, It's a Caleb versus Caleb. And, um, but there, there's no relationship there, okay? Just, just kind of an interesting thing to note. So Caleb recounts his testimony, and in verse 9, he reminds Joshua about Moses' oath that was sworn to him and his children. He says, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed, wholeheartedly, passionately followed the Lord my God. You see his name there being lived out? And now Caleb is 85 years old, 45 years after he served as a scout. And then he says something really interesting here in verse 11. This 85-year-old says, I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me 45 years ago. My strength now is as my strength was then for, for war and for going and coming. Now, normally, if I heard an 85-year-old boast about being as strong as he was when he was 40, I'd think, man, this guy is delusional, right? But he can say this because he knew the battle was never his. It was the Lord's. The, God promised the land, and God keeps his promises. Caleb is just as strong now as he was before because it is the Lord's battle, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, he could have easily said, let's cash in on my retirement fund. It's time for a cruise. I'm 85 and I've earned it. Give me a lazy boy, a beer, and a game to watch on my big screen TV. But no. He says, give me this mountain. There's still some giants there. I'm going to go slay. That's where the Anakim live. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out, just as the Lord said. He's not ready to relax. He's passionate, ready to serve God wherever God calls him, whatever God call, tells him to do. So, 45 years earlier, the 12 scouts all saw the same thing. Land flowing with milk and honey. People who were much bigger. Ten said, we can't beat the giants. Two said, God will conquer the giants. Ten saw big problems. Two saw a bigger God. So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb because he wholly followed the Lord. This guy who interrupts Judah. Notice how this old man doesn't think he's useless. If you're retired, if you're elderly, it doesn't mean you're irrelevant. We need you. And young adults, younger people, don't think just because they're older, they're out of touch. We have collegians, young adults, young married couples who need your friendship, your wisdom, your mentorship. A lot of, a lot of you are saying, like, I can't keep up with this technology. I don't know. It's okay. It's your wisdom we're after, not your Google skills. Okay? Younger people, please don't blindly follow our culture that looks down at the elderly and minimizes their experiences, their wisdom. Because if you do that, you rob yourselves of all that richness. So in chapter 14, Judah is about to receive their land inheritance. 
Caleb cuts in the line, interrupts him, and says, hey, remember Moses' promises. Serve faithfully where God has put you, wherever, whatever he calls you to do. I started out with this sermon illustration about King Henry III. He was able to rule well where God placed him because he was willing to submit himself. And I just wanted to end with that to say, you know, you may not like your circumstances. You may be the only one in your slice of pie. And you say, I don't know, I don't really feel like I fit. But for whatever reason, God has put you in that place, whether it's at work, in your family, at a church, in your fellowship. You may feel like the odd person out, but God says, conquer the giants. God says, possess my promises. And the only way to do that is to serve him wherever he calls, whatever he tells us to do. Let's offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. There's a response form. I know it's really easy to skip this part, but we really love to hear from you. If you're willing to just go to that place and then fill it in, check some boxes, you're more likely to remember these applications. You're more likely to follow through. So at tinyurl.com slash OCCEC dash response. Do we have it on screen? Oh, it's not on, it's not on the screen. That's all right. Okay, so it's OCCEC dash response, not docs, okay? Circle the letter A or check the letter A if you'd like to discover what God has entrusted you to do. Maybe you don't have a clue. I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, okay? Check the letter A. Say, I'm willing. I don't know what, but I'm willing. Roland or I will contact you, and we'll try to find a place where you can exercise your gifts and your expertise. Check the letter B if you realize, huh, maybe the reason why I have some unnecessary suffering. You know, some suffering is inevitable. Some suffering, but some suffering is avoidable. It's the stuff from disobedience, and you're realizing, ah, I need to stop giving in to this temptation because all it does it brings, is bring me trouble. Check the letter B if that's the case. Check the letter C if you realize, hey, I don't think I'm fully serving God on his terms. I'm kind of holding out and waiting for a better circumstance before I jump in. You've got to remind yourself, God is my inheritance. God is my abundance. God is my richness. That's why I appreciate we've got people here serving on some of these areas. They, some of them have been doing it for months on end because we can't find volunteers. If you're willing to come learn, if you're good at computer games and stuff, you need people to help with OBS and things like that, you know, don't wait for your terms to all line up. Serve God wherever he's called you. And this is for families. You know, I, I remembered finally. We had a family series and I, we had, Roland, we need to try to have an application for family members uh, for every sermon. But this is something that we need to emphasize. We, let's keep our promises. If you promise to do your chores, do it without being asked. <laughs> if you promise that you would pay for something, do it right away. Don't wait for them to remind you three times. You know, family is where we should show our faithfulness, our, our, that we are countable, because that is a testimony to our family members about God's faithfulness. A lot of times we don't think God's going to keep his promises. Why? Because in our own families, our parents haven't kept their promises. And so especially us as parents, will you check D and say, I'm going to be more diligent about keeping my promises, especially to my family members, whether it's up or down or sideways. Okay? We need to be promise keepers, not promise breakers. And finally, if you have a prayer request, please Take a moment to fill it in, something that we enjoy doing because we see so many answered prayer requests. And it just gives us so much joy. It gives God glory when we see his prayers answered. Okay, let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your word in chapter 13 and 14 of Joshua. And I know it looks like a big list of four names, but thank you that even in this list, we find so many practical, relevant, powerful applications 
Spirit of God, I'm asking that you would take these applications and for each person watching, either on site or viewing on screen, that at least one of the applications would hit home. And it would cause us to, to meditate and to wonder, Lord, what do you want? Not about what I want, but how can I serve you? How can I glorify you more? Thank you, Father, for these two chapters serving as an example and instruction and warning to us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.